Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our September edition of the ISC webinar series. Uh, my name is Mackenzie DeGaspero. I'm a program development coordinator at the Invasive Species Center, um, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the Invasive Species Center honors the long history of the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis Nation people on the lands we now know as Canada, and strive to show respect to their ancestors, their communities, and to them individually. We greatly appreciate the significance of the lands, waters, and all living things, and offer our gratitude to the Indigenous people for their care and teachings about our Earth. Our relationships with Indigenous communities are important, and we will continue to listen and learn how we can be in a good relationship with the Indigenous peoples, the lands and waters, and all living things and act accordingly. Invasive Species Center would like to acknowledge that our head office is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Batuana, and Garden River First Nations, as well as the longtime settlement of the Métis people in the Robinson Huron Treaty area. Invasive Species Center is a not for profit organization that connects stakeholders, knowledge, and technology to prevent the introduction, spread, introduction and spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. We also have a lot of great invasive species resources on our website, including species profiles, best management practices, and more. So check out our website at www.invasivespeciescenter.ca. You can also sign up on our homepage to our newsletter and buy weekly media scan and event invitations, which is where you can hear about any upcoming webinars that are included in this series. And before we get started with today's webinar, I just have a couple of housekeeping items that I'd like to mention. There will be time for questions at the end of the webinar, so please add your questions to the question box. We'll go through them with Salupe at the end of the webinar. If you're having any technical difficulties at any time, please pop your questions into the chat box and we will respond to you via the email that you registered with. We've also enabled closed captioning, so if you'd like to follow along that way, you can turn it on uh, using the closed caption button on your taskbar. And finally, there will be a very brief survey following the webinar, and if you'd like to take a couple minutes to fill that out, we would greatly appreciate your feedback. With that, I would like to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Felipe Dargent. Felipe is an evolutionary ecologist working on enemy victim interactions in the context of complex communities. Um, in particular, he's interested in the eco-evolutionary causes and consequences of anti-parasite defense. To address questions in this research area, he uses a diverse toolkit that includes experimental evolution, laboratory assays, field surveys, and mathematical modeling. Uh, I was grateful to be able to work with Felipe, which feels like years ago in the class and lab at the University of Ottawa, so I'm happy to have him back here with me today. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to you to share your, your screen, Felipe, and, and get on with your great talk that we're excited for. Thank you very much for that nice introduction, Mackenzie. Let me share. Okay, this should be ready. And okay, can you hear me well and can you see my, my slides? Everything looks perfect, Felipe. You can take it away. Okay, thank you very much. And um, thank you and welcome all to, to my presentation. I want to show you today the results of our pilot study that is a collaboration between the Canadian Forest Service, the Invasive Species Center, and the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at U of Ottawa. So the key question that I will be talking about today is whether we can use isotopes as signals to understand fruit bass badworm dispersal. And it is a really complex problem from the ecological perspective uh, to the tools that need to be used to monitor it. And I, we think that we have uh, found a very good tool set that allow us to track a complex uh, question in this area, which is how these things disperse. And dispersal in spruce badworm is important. Here I'm showing you a, a picture from Altonville, Quebec, uh, uh, taken in 2016, sorry, Altonville, New Brunswick, uh, during this thing that looks like an apocalyptic a situation where you have like this cloud of moths descending on town. Uh, instead of falling somewhere in the forest, they just uh, ended up falling in this town. And uh, these dispersal events are rare. They are very difficult to track, but they can be massive, as you can see here. And sometimes when they fall in towns, they need either heavy equipment to clean them up afterwards. So these events can lead to major spruce badworm outbreaks, and these outbreaks are really serious business. 
to put things in a little bit of perspective during the last uh, outbreak uh, a couple of decades ago, it is estimated that timber losses were of about 85 to 107 million cubic meters per year. That is proportionally about 50 to 70 percent of what was harvested in Canada in 2016. 50 to 70 percent. So that's massive. Of course, it has broader impacts. So what I want to do today is tell you a little bit about the ecology of this pest species, then how can we try to use isotopes to address key problems in our understanding of this species, which is dispersal, and focus on free isotopes, strontium, sulfur, and um, hydrogen, to, to talk about uh, some tests that we run to try to differentiate locals from immigrants. And finally, try to show you how we use these isotopes to identify the sources from where these moths might be coming from and some applications of this. So first of all, uh, I want to explain a little bit why this is a, back, like a major challenge and give you some background on the species. Spruce woodworm is widespread in North America and it's actually the most common and most important pest species of the boreal forest. So here I'm showing you the distribution of their main food, which is balsam fir and white spruce. And in the hash area, you can see the distribution of spruce badworm. And uh, given the presence of adequate host food, basically the, the firs and, and the balsam fir and uh, the spruces, you can expect that it is believed that these things will expand in the range with some uh, changing climatic conditions. So it is possible that we are going to see worse epidemics of this and a broader spread in their distribution, causing more problems to forestry. Uh, broadly speaking, they lay eggs around late July to August, and the first thing sorry, emerges soon after, and then it forms uh, a second instar, and then it spends the whole of winter in hibernation, basically living from the energy reserves that they had as eggs. Around April, they emerge again and start feeding like desperately. Uh, we especially on, on new fronts, and this can cause heavy defoliation, and they will feed and continue growing until around some point in June, when they will form their pupa, uh, and after 10 days, they will emerge as adults, and these adults basically emerge during a period of about two weeks, and then uh, they live for about 10 days, and during those 10 days, they basically mate, lay eggs, disperse, lay more eggs and die. What this means is that you can have massive population growth really fast, and this can lead to outbreaks. Uh, outbreaks are also widespread, especially in this area of Eastern Canada, and they can be very well synchronized around the, the whole distribution range. So outbreaks are not something new. They, they, they occur cyclically, cyclically, and another important thing to keep in mind is that an outbreak's main characteristic is that you move from a population that is extremely low to a population that is about 10,000 times larger. So four orders of magnitude bigger than, than, than it was when they are like at an endemic density. And we know that these events have been occurring in the past. We, we have been, been tracking them very closely through population surveys since the 40s. But we also have historical records. And more, more interestingly, we also have free ring analysis that build a really compelling picture that, that these outbreaks have been uh, going on at least since the 18th century. And they happen in about 30 to 40 year cycles. So again, like they repeat every, every, every series of years. The fact that these outbreaks are a natural phenomenon though does not mean that they do not have major impacts. And we are currently going into an outbreak phase. To give you an idea of how this looks like, I'm showing you a map from Quebec showing the defoliation in 2013 and then the current defoliation in 2020. And what you can see there is, especially that red area is the area of like really heavy defoliation. Measuring the defoliation severity gives us an idea of what is the impact of this species, but also what is their distribution. And you can see that this area has spread very quickly. What you're not seeing in this map is that it also is spreading into the Maritimes and into Ontario. So a key thing also is that 
anywhere from between these red areas, any uh, takeoff event could happen, a new dispersal event. So it's important to understand how this happens and how they move to understand how we can control better these populations. These outbreaks, of course, have like very important ecological and social and economic impacts. And the most direct of these impacts from this multi-annual defoliation, particularly of those new fronts, is that you have repeated defoliation that leads to reduced growth of the, of the tree stands, very often up to 90% of the whole stand. And then you have increased mortality. For example, in balsam fir stands, we know that it can be around 85% of mortality. This, in turn, has several impacts. One is that it affects forest regeneration and succession. It affects the, the structure of communities in that forest and the dynamics between the species that live there. It increases the chances of forest fires. It reduces the capture of CO2, but it also leads to increased emission of CO2 because of all that dying wood. It, of course, has massive costs in terms of revenue loss and in terms of, of costs for mitigation efforts. And finally, that leads to several job losses. So it, it is an important problem. Um, so one of the uh, important questions in this is that, how does these outbreaks happen? How, how do we have this, this outbreak occurring? And one of the best supported theories that explain this is the double equilibrium theory, which proposes that there are two states. There is a low density equilibrium state and there is a high density epidemic or outbreak state, right? And the density of the moths vary massively at any one site when we have either of these two stable equilibriums. The idea is that these endemic and epidemic states are very difficult to move out of. So if, for example, you have a, a population at low density that is increasing in numbers, uh, predators and parasitoids will start eating them more often, and then you will have that population falling down again to its equilibrium state. And generally what keeps this population from growing, uh, there's some stochastic effects about like density of larva, but mostly it's related to predation and parasitism keeping these populations down. If for whatever reason it manages to pass this hump, it is going to fall now into this stage of epidemic population dynamics where recruitment is so large every year that the predators and, and parasi parasitoids cannot do much and basically are swamped by, by the sheer numbers of individuals. So how does this model lead to widespread outbreaks? Well, uh, current evidence suggests that dispersal plays a central role in this spread and synchronization of outbreaks. Individuals at high density areas, like these red areas, where we have like heavy defoliation, uh, can disperse from these sites into other areas and potentially in quite massive numbers, right? So they will move from this red area to an area that is a, a, an endemic state, so low density, and then they will start laying eggs and contribute to a drastic increase in the density of the population the next year, right? Like they, they will put the eggs, those things will emerge, and then you will have a massive number that starts next year. So basically you, it, this influx of individuals on new eggs allows you to move this hump and stay now in this level, which is the epidemic state. Uh, so what I want you to get from this is that dispersal plays a critical role. And if we understand dispersal, we can better predict the conditions that drive it. So what leads these moths in this specific region to start dispersing? What makes them fall in this other specific region and stay there? And of course, it can also inform our ability to predict better and manage better these population changes before they reach an equilibrium. So if we know that some moths have arrived at this area and that they are uh, immigrants, we can take action immediately to try to avoid these populations to crossing over. Uh, yet, one of the main challenges with this is that tracing the movement of spruce batworm is incredibly challenging for several reasons. And in a nutshell, this is because traditional methods that we use to assess animal dispersal have very limited applicability for this system. Uh, one has to do with, with the behavior of the moths, that these dispersal events are quite rare. That doesn't mean that they are not massive and important, but they are relatively rare every year. And they don't spread homogeneously in the landscape, right? They have a directionality generally carried by winds. And they 
because these things get active and fly upwards during dusk, and then they get transported by the wind. So they are not active flyers. Uh, but that makes them be like very little predictable. Like it's very difficult to predict when they are going to, to emerge and when they are, sorry, when they are going to, to take off and where they are going to go. And other systems, so for example, that have been very successful like tagging that is used for monarch butterflies don't really work on this population because they can emerge from anywhere in this area. So just going and tagging individuals without any assumption that they are going to actually emerge is incredibly costly and not really effective. Furthermore, we don't know where they are going to land. So that again reduces the possibilities of this method working. Then there are several other characteristics of insects in general, not just this one, that make it difficult. For example, they are too light to use radio tagging. And other tools that could be effective, for example, genetic tools where you just go to a population, sample it and see whether there is any population structure, are not really working here either because all of the eastern uh, range of this of this uh, pest species tends to have a lot of gene flow. So there's not much population structure among these different subgroups. They look all like the same sort of single population. So we believe that instead of doing these things, we could instead use isotopes to track dispersal. Since isotopic tools, do not suffer from all of these other limitations. And I'll explain a little bit more about how we use isotopes and a little bit more of background of what isotopes are. So isotopes are alternative forms of the same element and they have the same number of protons and electrons. Uh, so basically they have the same atomic number and they have the same chemical properties. But where things get interesting is that isotopes differ in their number of neutrons. And that means that they differ in their mass and therefore their physical, not chemical, properties. So this, this isotopes vary in proportion. Here I'm showing you uh, one of the most used isotopes, stable isotopes, which is hydrogen and deuterium. And hydrogen is the most abundant isotope form of this, this system. Uh, and it has a mass of one, only one proton, whereas deuterium has a mass of two, a proton and a neutron. And it's a lot less abundant. But this mass difference is really important. So the key thing about mass differences and how they affect physical processes is that you have uh, mass and light uh, isotopes and atoms uh, means that they respond slightly different to biophysical processes. And therefore, the relative abundance is going to change through space. So with water evaporates, for example, here, water is evaporating from the ocean. Uh, the heavier isotopes are more likely to stay in the liquid phase, whereas the lighter isotopes are more likely to move to the gas phase, which means that water vapor is going to be depleted in heavy isotopes. It's going to have a lower value of, of this delta to H, right? And when it rains, these heavier isotopes are also more likely to fall. So in the liquid phase, uh, so to fall with that liquid phase with the rain, right? Here. And then the gas becomes further depleted. So it becomes more depleted than it was before because it uh, stays with the lighter isotopes and becomes depleted of the heavy ones. Then you move further and then it rains again. And again, the heavier isotopes are more likely to fall down. And that makes the, the, the rain signal and the, the gas signal to be different. So basically, as this process keeps moving further inland, the process of precipitation and evaporation keeps repeating, and the process of depletion of the heavy isotopes keeps uh, going on, which means that you have an increasingly depleted signal of heavy, the depleted uh, heavy isotope signal in this uh, rain. So here, for example, is minus 14 per mil and then minus 31 per mil as you move inland. So through space, what this means is that this variation in isotopic signal in the surface is going to integrate into everything that consumes that water. So all organisms that are consuming that, that water. And you're going to have a variation in that isotopic signal of D2H. Uh, just a quick note, you're going to see this delta uh, uh, in several places in this presentation. It is a common way to refer to isotopes. And without going too deep, we use this because we are really good at measuring isotope ratios, so uh, hydrogen one to hydrogen two, to deuterium. Uh, uh, but we are not as good 
and we have a lot of difficulty measuring absolute numbers. So what we normally do is we measure those relative numbers, right? And we compare them to internationally known value standards that allow us to calibrate the true value of the samples. And of course, make them comparable to any other laboratory that is doing this. So for several isotopic systems, similar processes, conceptually at least, uh, occur. And that allows us to expect these isotopes to vary predictably in space. What is important is that all our organisms that build their tissues from a local signal, for example, from minerals and water that gets incorporated into the organic tissues, then gets this, this local signal gets passed through the food chain with a small uh, offset due to metabolic processes, these biophysical processes, right? The other key aspect to, to understand here is that when organisms move from one place to another, they carry with them that uh, signal of the place where they formed the, their tissues. So the idea of that is to leverage these concepts to track spruce badworm uh, dispersal. So what I'm showing you here is basically a spruce that is incorporating signals from the local hydrogen, strontium, and sulfur isotopes into its tissues, and then it is passing it up the food, well, not up the food, it is passing it up to the to the spruce badworms. What is really interesting from this is that, for example, here I'm showing you a model distribution of strontium, and I'm showing you two different places, one with high values of strontium and one with low values of 87 to 86 strontium ratios. And what you would expect is that in the, in the red side, organisms are going to incorporate the red signal, and in the blue side, organisms are going to incorporate their blue signal. More interestingly, though, is that if this mouth here, the red mouth, were to move to a blue side, you could say two things about that mouth when you look at the isotope profiles. One is that you can infer that that moth is from, coming from somewhere else, so that it's an immigrant and not looking like the locals, which are blue. And the other thing is that you can then go back to the model maps of isotope distribution and infer where are the potential sites where these moths could have come from. So the red sites in there. So just to give you a broad idea of how the isotopes that we use work, uh, we have, uh, we have, for example, D2H, which is uh, hydrogen deuterium ratios. And this, this vary in the surface. For example, hydrogen mostly ref reflects differences in evaporation and precipitation. And as it moves from the equator to the poles here, or from the coast inland, uh, we expect to see a depletion of the heavier isotopes, thus lower D2H values. And you can see that it varies continuously through the landscape and, and the landscape, and it also varies at like really large scales. So it has like somewhat of a low resolution. Strontium isotopes instead vary discreetly in space, and they have a much higher resolution than, than hydrogen isotopes. Variation in this system is primarily influenced by the age and mineral composition of rocks. And we are lucky because it's extremely diverse in Eastern Canada, the area that we are studying for spruce backwards. So for sulfur, that is the other isotope that we use, like there isn't that much that, that is known. This is one of the newer isotopes that we are developing. As you can see, there's no global isoscape, uh, even if rough, uh, but there are some local isoscapes that have been developed. And what we know is that sulfur isotopes uh, ratios on the surface are influenced by a couple of like really important processes. One is that ocean water has very high values, like, like around 20, of uh, D34S. And when water sulfates evaporate, or when there are waves breaking that produce sea spray, these are transported inland and carrying those high values. Then they are deposited. And as they move further inland, you can see here, as things move further inland, uh, these isotopes become depleted of the heavy isotope, right? And they start going lower in their values. So as you move further inland, you have like a movement from high to low values of, uh, of D34S, reflecting that uh, dispersal of, uh, or deposition of uh, water uh, from the sea. But the other important thing here is that 
in the inland areas, they are also susceptible to differences in the relative availability of local sulfates and sulfites, which influence this signal too. So, at the, and that, that is uh, based in the local geology. So, what we end up having is a mix of discrete distributions with some continuous distributions, but the strongest variation happens close to the coast. So, these are the three isotopes that we use. And you might be wondering now, why do we use more than one isotope, right? Uh, we do this because isotopes vary in space in response to different drivers, as you might have already figured out. And also because they vary at different scales. So, for example, uh, D2H varies at very large scale and it varies continuously, as I said, whereas strontium varies at much smaller scales, uh, about like a, a kilometer or so, and it varies discreetly. So, when we combine these two isotopes, it allows us to look first at different levels of variation, but also as, as they can work as independent sources of evidence to build our conclusions. And imagine if you overlay these two things on top and you have moths traveling. If moths are uh, traveling far distances, we will be able to, to tell something about this long distance dispersal from the D2H, but much less about the short range dispersals. Strontium deals with that because it allows us to understand how things vary at that short scale. Although with strontium, it's much harder to make inferences about distance. We really cannot make any difference about this, only that things are different. So that is why we get both and we get much increased precision when we combine both subsotope systems. So now I'm going to focus more on the, on the main project that we developed uh, about the developing isotopes as geolocation tools for spruce badworm. And we had two main objectives here. One was to confirm whether dispersal events had occurred at a given site and whether we could tease apart locals like based on their isotope values from immigrants. Then the second objective was knowing whether the local isotopic signal, how that, does it varies in space and use analytical techniques and modeling to assign the potential origin of those immigrants. So use everything we know about these isotopes, new isoscapes too, to try to say like, okay, these are immigrants and these immigrants are coming potentially from these areas with high probability. So to gather our molds we, uh, and to sample them, we use uh, an automated sampling uh, trap network that is being deployed around Eastern Canada. And this allows us to, at a very basic level, tell a part between immigrant and putative locals that we can use then to, to make our, ask our questions. This automated trap network is set in all these different places and it monitors population activity and dispersal dynamics. The main goal of this network is that it allows us to look at uh, these population dynamics every day, multiple times a day, but without going to have and pick up these traps several times a day, right? And also it allows us to do some very cool stuff that I'm going to talk now about. So the traps work really simply by uh, exuding some pheromones that attracts and lures those, those moth individuals into the trap. This trap gets in, falls through this funnel, and then it gets stick into a, into a roll of sticky paper. And you can see all the, the moths that fall at a certain time point uh, on that sticky paper. What is really useful about these traps is that they have a cell phone network that takes photos four times a day. Right? sends the, those photos to us. We can look at those photos. And then it has a cell phone connection that allow us to send a signal to roll the sticky paper when it's too loaded and have like a clean sticky paper. Also, it's a way of archiving our samples. So what I'm showing you here in the bottom is moths that were con collected consecutively. So you can see that not much happened in these three time periods. And suddenly there is a massive increase of moths in the sticky paper, which represents probably a very active population or a potential immigration event. At some point we decide like, well, there's too many moths in the paper. We send the signal, the thing rolls, and now we have clean paper again. So I now I'm going to explain a little bit more how we tease apart these locals from immigrants. But the main idea here is that uh, we get this photo at 23 hours, uh, that is basically the time where we have most local movement. And I'm going to explain the next slide how the, the reasoning behind this. But we have local movements and we identify, we look at the photo and we say like, okay, well, these guys 
are probably good samples for using as locals. Then in the next photo, which is uh, a couple of hours later, which we assume it's an immigrant event, we look at the motos, uh, the moth distribution there, and we say like, okay, let's sample these five guys, and we're going to use them as the immigrants because they arrive after 23 hours, but before five in the morning. And what we do then is what we this thing, this machine continues to be in the field, continues rolling. At the end of the season, we go back, pick up the roll, take it to the lab, unroll it, and then go and look for my specific moths that I want to test. But I'll explain you what is the rationale behind this, this time periods because that, that might not be obvious. Uh, this is a really practical and smart tool to try to infer like the migration events in the moths. And it's based on their flight behavior. Uh, and these traps basically are time to take the photos at meaningful time points uh, that reflect this flight behavior. So we know that spruce budworm moths tend to fly vertically around dusk. That is the time where they get really active. So they start flying vertically and sometimes they go even to a couple of hundred of meters. And then after that, they just come down and settle. But if there are strong winds, those winds can carry these flying moths from the, the air cone and disperse them to other places. So that is basically the main mechanism behind dispersal events. They start doing their normal behavior, going up, and then they get carried away. So basically, if this, these moths that are being carried away are not going to fall in a trap at the normal time where they are active. They are going to fall in a trap hours later when they end up their, their, their transportation, right? And the rationale behind this then is that we take photos that cover a period that we know it's like the first photo comes before dusk and the second photo comes after dusk and where we expect them to have settled, right? So before dusk, we take the photo and this, we expect that moths are going to start getting active, uh, more, more, more active until then they start calming down and they, they just settle for the night. But then individuals that were being carried away are going to start falling in traps further away and they are going to start falling at times that are going to be after dusk, after the, the, the hour that we determined was going to be safe enough. And those individuals are going to be captured around the early hours in the morning. So this is in a nutshell how we tease apart immigrants from locals. Of course, this approach is not perfect. And one thing that we know is that there is a possibility that there will be some overlaps between immigrants and locals say that, for example, they are not very long distance immigrants. They were just carried an hour away, right? And therefore we are going to have some potential misclassification of individuals that get trapped at the local time, but we're actually short distance immigrants. So this is one point where we need some more work on the system. Then just imagine that you have a large influx of immigrants. They are going to arrive there. They are going to survive. And then next night, they are going to start behaving like they normally do as locals, but they are, they are still immigrants, but they are now flying at the local time. So if we sample here, we are going to have potentially a mix of individuals and we're going to have like a, a mixture of iso isotopic signals. And definitely this is not anymore really telling of whether you have a local or uh, an immigrant. Basically, this is a very smart approach, but you could definitely benefit from the increased discrimination that we think isotopic signals can give it. So we wanted to start with the best potential evidence to evaluate the system. So the way these immigration events and locals are, are identified is not just by the hour of capture. This is a, a, a multi-factor method that tries to improve further this precision, right? And it's just a combination of wind and local temperature, the areas of defoliation, the phenology of the, of the bad worm, the behavior, as I explained, and radar images. And of course, it's still going to be effective, but it's going to have some of the limitations that I have mentioned and others, right? So this is what we're basically testing. So to test this, we collected samples at six different sites uh, in, in Eastern Canada. Three of the sites, Forestville, Baldwin, and San Modest, come from an area where it is going, uh, experiencing an epidemic event. So an outbreak area, and they are relatively inland in the sense that they are not directly in the sea. 
right next to the sea. And then we have these other three areas that are at the margins of the spruce bloodworm distribution, are more in endemic stages, and therefore have much lower population densities, or used to have, actually, at least for when we sample. So now I'm going to explain and show you some of our, our results. To make sure that I was getting a good understanding of the dynamics locally and that I, and to get a, make sure that I had a better expectation of what was going on with the samples that we got as locals and immigrants, I decided to look at the detailed information from the trap captures for those for each one of these sites. So I plotted trap capture date on the x-axis, right? And then the number of new captures on the y-axis. And what you're going to see are red lines that basically reflect the number of captures at dusk. And then blue lines that represent the number of captures at dawn. In principle, these dawn captures are more likely to be immigrants and the red captures are more likely to be locals. Then what I'm going to show you is with black arrows, the point in time where we got our sample of putative locals and with green arrows, the point in time where we got our sample of putative immigrants. And you're already probably thinking, well, that is, a, a, that is like a local behavior, right? And yes, this is the time at which locals behave, but the spreading time when there is no activity, basically this population has ended its cycle and the massive peak suggests that this was actually an immigration event confirmed by radar. Then of course, uh, we can have much more complex dynamics. And what you're seeing here is we sample the immigrants earlier in this population, and then we sample the locals later on, which begs the question whether, of course, we didn't have like an immigration that, that this earlier immigration could not have led to mixing of signals. And this is one of the things that you're going to notice later on. So what you can see is that two of our populations, those, those ones that are closer to the coast and are endemic, had a really nice signal of like local activity here and then not much going on and suddenly like a massive peak suggesting an immigration event that was confirmed by radars. But the other populations have sort of like mixed dynamics, right? Especially the ones that are in the outbreak area. So this is going to make a, a little bit more difficult teasing the signals apart, but also makes clear that, that we really need isotopes to, to clarify what's going on on those sites. So the data that I'm going to show you is going to look like this. Uh, I'm going to compare individuals from, that are presumed to be immigrants to the local distribution of uh, locals. So the distribution of locals. And this happens because these immigrants could all be coming from the same place, but that is unlikely. We know that immigrants might be coming from several different places at, at the same the dispersal event. So each of these immigrants get tested against the, the local distribution. And what you're going to see is that if they are significantly different, I'll color them red. If they are not, I'll leave them black. And if they are marginal, marginally non-significant, they are going to stay in gray. And you can see that this is a different population. This is different data. And we can tease apart, oh, the colors are not right. Okay, okay, this is what I wanted to show. Uh, we can tease apart uh, some individuals that are immigrant, but then there are these other individuals that becomes really difficult to know whether they are actually locals that got mixed there or whether they are immigrants that don't differ that much in their D2H signal, right? They could be like very short distance immigrants. So. Again, like this, this, this gives us a little bit more nuance on what is going on in those populations. So just to remind you, the three, like the two, like the three top populations are going to be populations that are at the margins and endemic state. And the bottom populations that I'll show you in the graphs are going to be populations that are at an epidemic outbreak stage. And they are going to be in the bottom. So what you can see from this is that D2H allows us to tease apart locals from immigrant individuals. You see those red points all around, right? Uh, so you see these are different, these are well different. These two, but not these, are easy to detect the difference. Of course, uh, that doesn't mean that these are not different in the sense that they are not immigrants. They might just be short distance immigrants or they might be locals. That's why we need all the right. Uh, what you can see also here is that there is 
this works best when we have populations that have a very clear uh, event where we capture the locals and then a clear event where we have an immigration. So the next thing that is important to note here is that we are detecting or are, sort of are, are detecting individuals that have been misclassified as locals, but we have a, need, a signal that actually is telling you that there is an immigration event going on. So this is not a local, this is possibly, possibly someone that fell in the previous day as an immigrant and now is just like uh, flying with the locals at the same time. With strontium, again, like you can see that strontium allows us to tease these, these signals apart and we can tease immigrants in red from the local signal in all of these ones. But uh, immigrants uh, are present in many of these populations, but misclassification of locals, like again here in, in Forestville, this is probably an immigrant, uh, hinders some of the detection of those immigrants, right? Like this is not a statistic, any of these guys are not statistically significant, uh, different because they are within the distribution of this. Like I am convinced by the isotopic signal that this is an immigrant. So again, like it shows that the, the, the traps and that the, the system that, that we were using before using isotopes has some limitations. Uh, other thing to notice that is interesting is that all these individuals, even though they appear to be coming from perhaps relatively the same area far away, from the isotope signal from hydrogen, we see that they are not coming from exactly the same place either. They have different strontium signals, which is again, very interesting. This is telling us something that hydrogen by itself couldn't tell us. And finally, when we use uh, sulfur to tease these individuals apart, you can see that, yeah, we can see differences again in immigrants different from the local population, but there is a lot of mixing going on and uh, some misclassification potentially. And also these signals seem to work better in when they are close to the coast as it would be expected because that is the area where sulfur varies the most. But further inland, they don't pick up differences that well. So in conclusion for this section, I want to highlight that uh, we have shown that uh, hydrogen, sulfur, and strontium allow good discrimination between locals and immigrants, but that the current methods that we are uh, using are good to detect dispersal events. So those traps are really good to detect that there is something going on, that there was a dispersal, there's a peak, there's like a lot of them flying at a time that is not the time where they should normally be flying but they don't provide the same level and the fine resolution that we get from using isotopes. So much so that we can detect misclassified individuals in the local populations that were classified using the other method. And then the other thing that is important to notice is that we're detecting lots of mixing of individuals from potentially different places or mixing between locals and immigrants in those populations. So in a nutshell, isotopes are able to improve the potential that this prop system has. So I want to wrap up this section talking a little bit about what potential applications we can have for, for this uh, system. And one of the important strategies that is being developed to try to control spruce uh, badworm moths outbreaks is the early intervention strategy. So we could apply this to the early intervention strategy on the one hand by going early to some sampling locations using the, the automated trap system, but also using the, the isotopes that we are collecting, collect individuals at these two sites, for example, that we're concerned about. Look at all those individuals, look at their isotopic signal and determine like if they are all locals, where well, we can go and invest our resources uh, somewhere else. For example, invest the resources for winter monitoring of the L2 larvae in, a, in another place. We don't really need to go here and invest all that money there. But for example, if we detect that there is a presence of immigrants, then we know that we need to act before this influx of immigrants move the population from this endemic equilibrium to an epidemic equilibrium and expands the outbreak. So of course we, 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 we can uh, do this at a much more cost efficient uh, way than it's currently done by monitoring L2 larvae 
in a haphazard manner and and uh, without much knowledge of whether they are going to have an important influx of immigrants or not. So there's potential for cost-effective approaches here. Another way that we could use and leverage these this, uh, tools that we have developed is to look at uh, invasive species and use this as an early detection system. For example, we know that uh, like just knowing whether an invasive species have actually grown in an area and they are potentially established uh, can be very helpful to inform the species. But on the other hand, we can also look at some of those uh, early establishing populations without knowing much more about them, without having any isoscapes, and just sample that population through time. And then we can uh, try to identify from these populations through time whether influx of immigrants can happen. Why do we care about the influx of immigrants? Well, they carry new genetic material that can facilitate local adaptation and a better hold and establishment of an invasion. So, for example, we sample at three time points, right? And we notice that the first two time points have a baseline as a topic distribution. So they look pretty much to each other. But then the third time point, we notice that there is a much widespread value of isotopes, which is suggesting that there has been some migrants captured there. And then we know that there is something going on at that population which requires further notice or potentially starting a, a mitigation strategy. So what are we doing? What we are doing now with this project is trying to get known origin individuals to increase the precision of our, of our isotopes and to be, be, build better isoscapes. What you notice already is that we have true locals when we build those systems, the ones that we presume are locals, but those are getting mixed with the immigrants and this is not giving us a very clean signal. Uh, so what we're doing now is going to uh, different places in Eastern Canada, collecting pupa that we know for sure ate in that exact location and letting them emerge and getting those uh, adult moths to run the, the analysis on them. This allows us to have a very clear, tight signal of what a local should look like, which then can inform our isoscape, but also can inform our decision making in those places. The other thing that we are doing is increasing much more the diversity of the sites that we are sampling. Isotopes vary for the main reasons that I have suggested, but they also vary for uh, to smaller degrees by other processes. And we want to understand really well how those smaller processes might influence our signals how they might influence our interpretations and how they might actually vary with space and with like environmental characteristics. So we are working on that aspect too. Uh, now, just for brevity, I am going to show you that we have built and we have developed, thanks to the collaboration of several people across institutions and across Canada, we have been working on forming isoscapes, and just to remind you, an isoscape is a predicted model, a model that predicts isotope distribution from in space. And one important aspect of this is that we have a mean distribution of the isotopes, and we also have a mean error structure. So we know in which areas we have a better ability to predict and which ones we don't have as good ability to predict uh, the isotope distribution. And the first layer of this is that we collected spruce from all around Eastern Canada, and we keep collecting some now, uh, to, to, to build these models. And then we use these models and we calibrate it with MOFs correcting again through Eastern Canada to calibrate them to the signal of the MOFs and to calibrate them to the signal, uh, like the sort of the strontium and for the D2H, but also for our uh, sulfur uh, spatial distribution. And you can see that these three isoscapes have very nice distributions and have also very complementary distributions. So they look different. They can tell us different things. When we combine these things together, uh, oh, oh, here, when we combine, combine the, 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 these isotopes together, we can start predicting where individuals might have come from. And here I'm just showing you three different immigrants, right? That were trapped in Forestville. And basically we use Bayesian analysis and some statistical modeling to try to uh, identify the areas of higher probability in green or lowest probability in pink and yellow, where these individuals might have come from. And then we can also do this thing one step further and mix all these different immigrants into a new layer 
that allows us to tell where, where this immigration event, not just individual, but immigration event could have originated from. And what you see here is that for those individuals that were trapped in Forestville, we think that there is a very high probability that they occur in this very small area in the Gaspé Peninsula. What is really cool is that that model only is based on isotopes and the, the special predictors that we know drive variation in those isotopes. But this model is basically just dependent on, the, on those distributions. And yet we find that our pro predicted the, the location of origin of these moths match really well the areas that are being currently defoliated and where we expect those moths to potentially have come from. So this saying that the, these models are really strong in terms of their predictive ability. Furthermore, when we call, call, compare these models with other ways of modeling uh, dispersal, for example, these atmospheric models that are used by our collaborator, Jean-Noël Candot, uh, this, these atmospheric models predict that, predict that this specific uh, dispersal event, which I'm showing you my prediction here with low probability in blue and high probability in red, came from this area. This is the high split model. This is the atmospheric model. And it's saying that it's probably coming from this area. My map, my isoscape, and my pre predicted probability map is showing that it came from one of these red areas, most likely this or this one, which matches really nice this dispersal event uh, to which the, the, the conclusion that they came from here arrived from completely different independent analysis, which means that our model is matching other predictions and what is absolutely like uh, shocking here is that this is a very small area. This is like about a 50 kilometer area. So we are being able to detect movement at a very small, fine scale with our uh, approaches. And we want now to combine these both approaches to refine this even further and be able to target quite precisely where these uh, moths are coming from. And with that, I just want us to leave you as take home messages that these free isotopes, hydrogen, sulfur, and strontium can be used to monitor insect pest dispersal and can be leveraged for using them to, for management tools. Uh, we have developed model databases and, and very interesting models to, to, that are currently missing in Canada. So there's no current uh, isoscapes for strontium or for sulfur, and we have developed this, and we want to make them uh, easily available. And this can also be calibrated for other pests. And finally, that in this process, although I haven't talked much about that, we have been addressing fundamental questions in isotope ecology, animal dispersal, and we have a much better and extended understanding of spruce budworm ecology. And with that, I would just to thank all the many people that have helped in this project and institutions, and I'm ready for your questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Felipe. Uh, as Felipe mentioned, if you have any questions, um, please submit them to the question and answer box and I will read them for Felipe. Um, I'm just wondering while we wait for that, Felipe, if you could expand a little bit on how you think that these techniques can apply to new or incoming invasive species. It sounds like it would be a great tool for maybe species that we already have here to figure out where they came from potentially. Um, and then what about incoming species that maybe aren't here yet? Is there an application there? So, so two, two things that I, I think are really, really interesting here is one, like if we find an invasive species, you often don't know if these individuals are already establishing here and you just bumped into one that grew there or you are actually seeing like early movements from somewhere else, right? We mm -hmm. can potentially roughly uh, look at whether they are locals or whether they have arrived from somewhere else and potentially where they could have arrived from. But it's much better when we have working isoscapes that have been calibrated for those specific mm -hmm. species. And the reason okay. that that is important is because once you have those isoscapes, you really don't need to pick up locals anymore. You just need to pick up individuals and test whether they, they come from that area or test whether they come from a different area and potentially which area. Yeah, very cool. That sounds like it will have great application for invasive species management moving forward. Okay. I don't 
don't have any questions coming in for you, Felipe. I guess you explained your, your stuff really well. So that's great. Um, yeah, so I, I don't have any other questions either. So with that, maybe I'll give it one more minute and see if anybody has questions trickle in. Um, but otherwise, um, if nobody has any questions, you're, you're free to go this afternoon. So thank you so much for attending. Um, and thanks for listening to Felipe's wonderful presentation about his very exciting research. Um, and please remember that we will have our survey available uh, right after the webinar closes. Um, and this webinar will also be posted on our website, a recording on our website and our YouTube channel um, after today. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us this afternoon and spending an hour listening to some information about some exciting isoscape work. Uh, so thanks again for sharing, Felipe. If you have any questions for Felipe um, after today, feel free to contact myself or Felipe if you want to share your email address for your incoming questions, and we can do that too. Absolutely. Please feel free to contact us or if you have a pest problem that you want to discuss with us, uh, I, I, we are always open to, to, to talking about these things. We find them really exciting. Awesome. Thanks so much, Felipe. And I think you mentioned to me earlier that you want to see if you can get samples as well for your isoscape yes. work. Yes, actually, yes. I would love, like, if you are in an area that is not one of the areas that we have covered and you can collect some spruce or balsam fir for us, or you can collect some of pupa and like keep them alive, that would be amazing. Awesome. So if you have any any way that you can help out Felipe with some, some spruce sampling, uh, please let either of us know. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk to you soon, Felipe. Thanks so much for joining today. Thanks a lot, Mackenzie. It's my pleasure. Okay. Take care. Thanks, everyone.